I think the biggest initial impact of Brexit was the impact that it had on our people, both our students and our staff, um, particularly those um, who are students from Europe or members of staff from Europe, who suddenly felt unwelcome uh, and not wanted, um, and, and obviously very concerned about the future here in the country. Um, you know, would they be able to continue living here after Brexit and those sorts of questions. So it was very distressing for them and it was, it was very raw, very emotional. I literally had people in tears uh, in my office. So we moved to reassure them as much as we could, you know, within the political constraints that of course they're very welcome here. Our European staff and students are a really key part of the very fabric of this institution. Um, we are London's global university and all of those European members of staff and culture add a huge amount to, to this, this institution. Well, I think the most important thing for the government to do as we face the triggering of Article 50 uh, within the next few days, the most important thing for the government to do is to try and move as fast as possible to create certainty for a, a European citizens. So right to remain in this country after the triggering of, of, of Article 50 and obviously after we eventually Brexit is the number one issue um, for both staff and students. Um, people have their lives here, they've built their lives here, they've given their best to this country. Um, many of them have got children at school or even children coming through to university. Some of them are undergoing healthcare treatments, you know, these are all things that have been very straightforward in the past and all of a sudden they're all up in the air. So we need that settled down as fast as possible. So the human side of it is something that we really want the government to focus on. Uh, well, we're, we're very lucky at UCL um, in that we're very attractive to international students. A, our reputation is huge and, and, and going very well out there, but also we're you know, based here in central London and that attracts a lot of students and that's one of the reasons why we've got uh, one of the biggest student, uh, international student bodies uh, in the sector. We're well over 10,000 students now, um, which is about 32% um, of, our, of our student body. They, they add a huge amount uh, to this institution, so their diversity, uh, the number of countries they come from, the different cultures that they come from, the way in which they apply that to their learning, and in particular uh, to the way in which they approach problems. We just find that hugely creative. Um, and it's really, really good for our home students because for many of them, of course, it's the first time that they're meeting people from, from so many diverse backgrounds. So it's good for the international students, they get a great education. It's also good for the home students because they get that interaction. And you put the whole lot together and you get that wonderful creativity that, that I think is very difficult to reproduce if you're more uh, monocultured. Mono I think our key principle at the moment with our international students is, is rather than focus on an individual country, um, uh, more to diversify um, and to be interacting with multiple markets. And I guess that's about protecting the institution from individual swings um, uh, in um, in, in the number of students that want to study internationally. Um, we have, of course, like every other university, a large number of Chinese students. For us, that's 29% of, uh, uh, of our international student body is from China. We wouldn't want it to grow above that. We, we feel that's around about the right level. Um, so we'd be looking for growth from, from, from other markets. South America would be an obvious one. The United States of America uh, is one that we're also finding uh, quite attractive at the moment and other uh, destinations in the Far East. Our personal um, interaction with India at the moment is very limited and that's uh, another opportunity that we uh, will look into. Well our, our um, strategy has included a complete revisit of everything we're doing uh, internationally so much so that we no longer call it our international strategy, we call it our global engagement strategy and that kind of gives you the flavour of the way that we're thinking about this. We are not particularly keen on overseas campuses. We do have three small ones 
uh, one in Adelaide, one in uh, Doha in Qatar, and we have also helped a university in Kazakhstan. Um, but our experience of that is that it's quite complicated um, and I think we feel that it's better to work in partnerships. So we've been developing some major partnerships. The, the two largest ones that we have are with um, Peking University in Beidou, um, and uh, that's a flourishing partnership that includes education and research, student and staff exchange. And we have a similar relationship with um, Yale um, in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale University. So we, we prefer that in-depth, complex mm -hmm. partnership working model. Uh, and that can involve uh, joint provision. Um, uh, uh, and it certainly involves a lot of interchange between the two universities. I suppose the biggest concern that I have, uh, you know, the thing that keeps me awake at night, if you like, is just the level of uncertainty in just about everything at the moment. Um, so there are uncertainties about student recruitment numbers related to issues like Brexit and to immigration policies of the UK. Uh, there are uncertainties about the future funding of higher education related to the TEF and, and what fee will, we, we will be uh, allowed to, to charge. Um, there are also uncertainties in research, you know, the whole of the European research landscape is, uh, funding landscape will change uh, over the next few years almost certainly um, and that's a huge amount of money for this institution, well over £60 million pounds a year from that source alone. Um, plus, of course, Stern Review um, and, you know, uh, the impact that that will have on the next research um, uh, evaluation framework. Um, so there's just change everywhere uh, and it's the multiplicity of that change and the way in which that will, you know, those factors will interact with each other. Um, that's the biggest worry and the thing that, uh, if at all, makes me sleepless. I, I, it's so, there's certainly more change going on at the moment than I can remember. And I, I've been a vice chancellor now since 2004, uh, so that's a good number of years. Uh, and of course, we've been through changes and you know, introduction of fees and increasing fees, um, but never all of these things at once. And higher education, I think, is very much more in the political spotlight now than it was back in 2004. Uh, we've become part of the political scene and therefore there's a lot of attention on us from the media, from, from politicians. I'm not saying that's inappropriate, I'm just saying it's different uh, and it all adds to, to that sense of constant change and things being less settled. I think my message to government would be to recognise, please recognise, I think they do, just how important higher education is to this country. There are very few sectors where we can say uh, that we're in the top three in the world uh, and at the moment uh, we rank second only to the United States of America for the excellence of our higher education system. That's something the country should be very proud of. It's something that drives um, our country's prosperity and part of that, obviously, is the economy of the nation. So we're a major part of all of that. And please remember that. And please, therefore, make decisions that help us contribute to the future of this country.